Can you guys see that yet? Okay, good. Um, okay, so tonight um, we're going to be talking about spring gardening, and um, this isn't a long presentation, but because we're, we're going to talk about really getting started in your garden, um, and then we're going to spend the next, uh, you know, ne the next um, class uh, is going to be all about tomatoes. We're going to get a little more in depth with a lot of vegetable gardening and things like that. So for tonight, we're going to talk about how to get you started. Um, all right, so before we get started, I just want to let you know that uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is an equal opportunity uh, program provider and employer. And um, if you ever have any questions um, or are looking for information regarding special needs or accommodations, you can contact our um, Cooperative Extension office at 609-625-0056. And that number will be at the end of this presentation. Um, or you can contact the State Extension Director's office um, if you have uh, concerns related to discrimination. Um, we are partially funded through Cooperative Extension through the USDA, and um, we're uh, focused on civil rights regulations and policies. Um, we're prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, religious creed, disability, age, political beliefs, or reprisal or, um, reprisal or retaliation for prior civil rights activities. So, um, we are an all-inclusive organization. All right, so let's talk about your uh, your spring gardens. Um, what condition is your garden in now? Um, I'm going to give everybody just a, a moment to put things in chat if you want. Um, if anyone has any any insight to what their garden looks like right now. So typically right now your garden, <laughs> yeah, it's, it probably does look just like dirt or it might look, um, you might have a lot of leaves, you might have some plants that, um, you know, have got some spent uh, stalks from last year, things that you left around for our pollinators um, and our birds for over the winter time. Um, one thing I would encourage you to do, and we're going to talk about this a few times over um, the next few months, I'm going to kind of mention this and then we'll have an entire program over it um, at the end of the year. But one thing we're going to talk about is a garden journal. Um, so you want to walk around your garden with a notebook this time of year. Um, check for the beds that you need to clean out. Um, look for winter damage on your plants. Um, and for anything that's uh, that shifted or any hardscaping that has rotted, um, you want to note any deer or rodent uh, damage to woody plants. Um, and then it's a good idea to look for new animal burrows um, for, uh, you know, things like skunks and groundhogs, rabbits. Um, this is a, a good time of year to look for any new ones. So you can make a note of that and where you need to, um, maybe change something so that you can, uh, deter those. Um, you want to prioritize your list and copy it into your garden journal. Um, you know, we're, like I said, we're going to talk about this over the year. So, and we're going to talk about, um, you know, why it's really important for you to keep a garden journal throughout the year and how that's going to help you have um, the best garden that you can um, going forward. Um, you may want to spend this time repairing any damage that you have um, to uh, things like broken fences and trellises, um, raised beds, um, while your plants are still dormant or very new. Um, so this is a great time to do that. And if you're a new gardener, which I know with the pandemic, we have quite a few people who are new to gardening. Um, this is the best time for you to build things like raised beds. Um, it's nice and cool outside. It's not really hot yet. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a really good time to get started, get some fresh soil in there and um, sort of start you on your journey. Um, I, down in the in the comments, Amy said her community garden uh, bed might need a little soil renewal. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, that's actually a really good idea. Okay. Um, so the next thing uh, we're gonna we're gonna focus on is cleanup. 
And um, it looks like we probably have a couple of people. Uh, Lori started doing that last week. Um, this presentation was originally intended to be a couple of weeks ago. So, um, so some of you may have already started these things, but if you hadn't, um, you're not too late. You can, you can start gardening anytime, but um, these are some things that you wanna focus on first to really get you set up to have a beautiful garden for the summer. Um, so spring is a good time to cut back all of the old stems and um, foliage of ornamental grasses before the new growth has started to emerge. Um, so any of the brown that you see, you can actually gather those up and put a tie around it, um, cut it off, and then throw that into your compost pile. Um, you want to cut back the dead stems of flowering perennials like your cone flowers, um, but don't chop those stems up just yet. Um, this is that time of year where you still have a lot of your pollinators that are emerging. Um, you know, you have uh, some of the overwinter, um, overwintering pupa or uh, stem nesting bees and other ben beneficial insects. Um, so we want to give them a little bit of time to emerge uh, before we chop up the stems and put them in our compost. So just something to be aware of. Um, you also want to cut back, cut back the stems of your summer flowering shrubs, like your butterfly bush, um, abelia, and blue mist shrub. Um, and you want to cut those back to about 12 to 18, 18 inches above ground level. Um, and this is going to encourage the growth um, as the new flowering stems come up, as well as contain the overall size and the shape of your, of your shrubs. Um, Next thing you want to do is remove the, the excess leaves and winter mulch that you might have um, put down uh, over the winter to keep your plants insulated. Now is going to be the time to, um, to start to remove that. Um, the reason you want to remove that, I, you know, mulch is not bad. Um, but you know, um, in your ornamental beds, uh, you, so you still wanna leave a thin layer of mulch, but the reason you wanna take back, uh, take off a lot of the excess mulch is that as the temperatures start to rise, if you keep that thicker layer, um, you'll actually keep the ground from heating up as, um, as fast as it could. So you'll keep the soil um, cooler than you really want it. Um, and maybe even a little more damp because keep in mind that one of the reasons we do that over the winter is that um, we're trying to keep moisture in and we're trying to keep, um, you know, our, our flowers protected from the cold, uh, from the cold weather. Um, okay. So again, um, just like we talked about with the hollow stems, you want to keep in mind that within those leaf piles and mulch piles, um, there are going to be a, a few of your uh, pollinators that have overwintered in there. So while um, you want to take those off, um, you also want to um, Keep a little bit of mulch handy um, to protect your new ve vegetation um, in case of overnight frost. I know it's hard to believe it's May and we think that, um, that winter is over, but in this area, our, uh, our last frost date is actually May 15th. Um, and I generally tell people, even though it's May 15th, um, keep in mind that some of your warm season vegetables, you might even want to wait an extra couple of weeks before you put them outside. Um, because, you know, we often have uh, random cold days um, at the end of May. Um, so, uh, in your flower and vegetable gardens, you may start to notice that you have your annual weeds coming up. And these are the kind of things that we're starting to get quite a few calls about. Um, we're starting to get calls about people seeing um, chickweed and hairy bittercress and um, some of your pretty common cool season weeds. Um, what you'll start to see over the next couple of weeks is that those are going to die off on their own. So as the temperatures warm up, these are cool season weeds. So they're going to start to die out um, on their own. So if you're seeing a lot of them in your lawn, you'll start to see less and less of them. Um, so a lot of times it's not really necessary to put something down on them um, because they're going to they're going to kind of die off on their own. Um, and we're at a point where their seed pods are already up. 
So um, pulling them out is actually going to spread them more than it's going to help your cause. Um, so always something to keep in mind that once you have the seed pods of weeds out, you have to be very careful when you're pulling them out, because um, especially if you're trying to keep very organic um, and you don't want to use any sort of pesticides because as the seed pods open up, they spread out um, and then you have a bigger weed problem next year than you had before. Um, so you want to carefully right now, especially you, um, cause we're a couple of weeks beyond and we're getting into that point where all their seed pods are, you want to carefully hand pull as many as you can. Um, and if you start to see that the, the seeds are already set, um, at this point, just let them die off on their own. Um, spring is also a good time to gently rake your lawn. You want to remove dead grass and sticks and other debris. Um, your soil conditions should determine when you begin planting your vegetable garden. So we're gonna talk about, um, you know, looking at soil tests and things like that in just a moment. Um, but you wanna squeeze a handful of your soil. If it crumbles when you open your hand, um, the soil is dry enough that you can go ahead and rake it up and, um, and start to, uh, you know, get it ready. Um, if it stays in a tight, a tight ball, it's still too wet to work it. Um, and what happens when you start to work your soil when it's wet, um, like for instance, you would never want to uh, work your soil while it, uh, in a day like today, where you have a light rain all day, um, because you could actually um, sort of uh, start to cause uh, soil compaction. And that's going to give you a more difficult time as you start to plant things. Um, so you want to kind of uh, hold off as long as it's, um, it's very wet like that. Um, you'll notice that our farmers uh, usually try to avoid um, doing any sort of tilling when it's really wet outside, and that's to avoid soil compaction. Okay, so next we want to set your garden up for success. Um, so early in the spring is the best time to enrich your soil without disturbing your plants. Um, and we often talk about, you know, if you haven't contacted the extension office for quite a while, um, if it's been three to five years since you've had your last soil test, one of the first things that you want to do is get a soil test. Um, you want to see, that's going to tell you how much nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium um, that you have in the, in the soil. And also you can actually set that soil test up, you're going to tell us whether you're going to be using it for a flower or vegetable garden or whether your that soil test is where you're going to have lawn. And your soil test results and recommendations are going to be a little bit different for each one of those. So if you're looking for flower gardening and vegetable gardening, um, we're going to, you know, those um, results are going to be tailored to what do you want to do to, to set yourself up for the most success with those type of plants. If it's for lawn, we're going to do the same thing. Um, but, but very specific to lawn maintenance. Um, if you've never had your soil analyzed, it's a very good idea to, uh, to start out with doing that, or if you're new to gardening altogether. Um, the other thing that you can do in our, in our office, oftentimes um, you don't really need a full so soil test if you've had one done recently, but what's always a good idea is to do a pH test. Um, that's something that we can do in our office. Um, it costs $2 and it takes us about an hour to do it. Um, oh, I will address that in just a moment um, about the soil test. Um, so, uh, so what you would do is um, you bring it in, you're, you're gonna go around just like you were doing a regular soil test. You're gonna take several different clumps of soil in the area that you wanna test the pH. You wanna put those in a little bucket, stir them around, and then give us a little baggie full. We don't need a lot because the cup that we're gonna use is about a three inch cup, a little Dixie cup um, that we're gonna use for uh, testing to see what your pH is. Um, our offices are closed to the public right now, but that doesn't mean that you can't bring a soil test in. What I need you to do if you need a, a pH test is give us a call, let us know that you need a pH test, and we'll give you instructions for dropping off the soil test 
Um, and uh, so we do have people working at our building. We just, uh, we're just not allowed to let people in um, that are not actually working in the building. Um, but we will give you instructions on how to do that. We'll take the soil test. Um, we'll check it, we'll check the pH, and then we'll give you a call with the results. Um, and we could also fax you the results as well. Um, and if you'd like for one of us to go over the results of your soil test with you, we can do that as well. Um, so what happens each time you do a soil test and you let the soil, the Rutgers Soil Test Lab know that you're from Atlantic County, um, they actually send us a copy of your soil test. So you can give us a call and we can bring it up and we can go through it with you. So if there's anything you don't understand, questions you have, um, we can always do that for you. Now, before I move on from soil tests, um, oh, let me talk about um, amendments real quick and then I will get to the questions on soil tests. Um, this is a good time of year that if you don't have a compost pile, this is a good time to start one because remember we're going to be picking up all the things um, in our lawn that have kind of overwintered sitting there. So this is a really good time for you to start your compost pile. Um, and then you have the warm months of the summer where you can keep it turned and by the end of the summer you're really going to start to see some nice rich soil that you can use. Um, one thing you can also uh, purchase it at ACUA. They have um, Echo Soil there, and um, there are also other places around that you can purchase um, composted soil. Um, all right. So one thing that you need to keep in mind and why we really encourage you to do a soil test is that um, uh, for, for a few different reasons. Um, the main reason is that, um, especially when it comes to pH, um, you need to have a certain ideal range of pH for different plants. And that, that varies depending on what type of plant you have. And typically in South Jersey, we have, um, we have a more acidic soil um, that's why we have uh, very good success with things like blueberries, uh, because they like a very acidic soil. So um, if you're trying, but if you're trying to plant, say, a vegetable garden, um, a sandy acidic soil is not going to be ideal for you. So we're going to let you know what it is that you would need to add to there and, a, you know, a, a good topsoil, um, echo soil, compost, um, those are a good start for you. Um, you know, as your, as your nutrients get out of balance, so say you have too much nitrogen, what that's going to uh, lead to is, a, is weak plant growth, and it also encourages insect pests. And that's going to be the true. That's going to be true of most of the nutrients in your soil. If something's out of balance, it leads to something else. Um, so you know, if your if your pH is too high or too low, um, that's going to make other nutrients within your soil less available to your plant. Um, so something to keep in mind. And again, something that we can go over with you when you have your soil test done, we'll be happy to go over with all of, the, of that with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you're gonna add any soil amendments like organic matter, um, often people add fish emulsion or seaweed extracts. Um, make sure that you read the directions very carefully on those. Um, and you know, and follow the directions. But this is the this is the perfect time to do that. Before you put your plants in the ground, that's when you want to add your amendments. Um, keep in mind that a lot of times when you're adding things like lime, um, those actually take um, a bit of time before they become fully av available in your soil. Um, so depending on the type of lime that you use, it may actually take six months before it really gets to that peak that you're looking for. Um, so that would be something that you would want to consider putting in the fall. Um, again, when you get your soil test results, that would be something that we would let you know. We, um, our soil test lab uh, might say you're um, slightly low, uh, you know, you either need a little more lime or don't touch it right now. If you're borderline, we might say go through this season and then in the fall, this is what you're going to need. Um, Okay, so just to answer the, um, the soil test question uh, quickly down there, um, you put it for a garden and uh, got results for a lawn. If you could give our, call, our office a call or the Rutgers Soil Test Lab, um, they may be able to reformulate that. But, um, but I will get back to you because I wanna see if there, you know, it, the soil is the same, but they might be able to, to um, tweak the results so that you get that more for a uh, garden rather than um, lawn. 
Um, can you use Weed Be Gone? I'm going to get back to that separately, um, just because we're, we're not really talking about pesticides tonight. But um, at the end of the presentation, I'll see if I can look something up for you. You can use it, um, but you really want to be careful about how you use it and where you use it. Um, okay. The next thing I want to talk about is tool maintenance. That's one of the uh, probably one of the most important things um, for you to look at at the beginning of the season. And when I talk about tool maintenance, I'm talking about everything from your hand tools, like your trowels, um, your rakes, your shovels, um, and even your lawnmower. You want to make sure that you have good sharp blades on your uh, your lawnmower. That's going to give you a healthier lawn. Um, and then also you want to make sure that your tools are nice and clean, especially if you know if that you've had any sort, any sort of fungus or bacteria in your garden from um, from last year. Um, you want to make sure that you clean your tools off really well so you don't spread any of that bacteria. Um, having dirty gardening uh, tools and uh, and even your pots can actually spread bacteria throughout your garden. Um, so you wanna, and it can make a healthy plant into an infected plant. So you wanna be kind of conscious about that. Um, so you wanna take the time now to clean, sharpen and oil all of your tools. Uh, make sure you clean all of the rust off, um, give them a little oil in any of the uh, moving parts. Um, and then you wanna make sure that you disinfect them. Um, there's a few different ways that you can disinfect them. And um, at the end of this presentation, I will put um, a link to, uh, to a couple of different options for uh, disinfectants that are going to be the best for making sure you have disinfected tools, but you're being careful of the environment as well. Um, but I want to make sure that we talk about a couple of things. You want to, when it comes to using any kind of disinfectants, and typically we're talking about using alcohol, using bleach, um, or using Lysol, something like that. Um, there, you want to make sure, like with any chemical, you want to make sure that you use them with caution. Make sure you're using gloves. Make sure that um, if the label of the pesticide says that you should be wearing a mask, then you absolutely should be wearing a mask. Um, pesticide safety is really one of the most important things that we talk about throughout the year. Um, it is, it keeps everything, uh, it keeps you from getting sick and it also makes things safer for our environment. Um, so uh, always store them out of reach of children. I know everyone knows that, but, um, and also vulnerable adults. Um, keep them in a dry location with a stable temperature. So be careful about putting them in a shed or putting them in your in your garage because those don't, don't necessarily have the stable temperature and the stable temperature is really important. Um, you never ever want to mix disinfectants with other chemicals. Um, you don't mix uh, bleach, with the, uh, bleach with ammonia or any of the other disinfectants you might use. You never wanna mix them. You wanna make sure that if they're mixed with anything, it would be water. Um, um, Lori, I see your question and I will answer that in an email because I'm gonna send you something specifically on ground, groundhogs. Um, but I want you to think that I, I didn't see your question. We will answer it. Um, also, if used improperly, disinfectants can cause harm to, uh, not just to the user, but again, uh, the user and the environment. So we wanna keep be careful of that. Um, and I will, I'm gonna give you a link. I'm not gonna go through this entire fact sheet, but we do have some, uh, you know, I, I do have a fact sheet that will give you some ideas on the best, um, disinfectants to use to make sure that you have uh, clean tools and you're ready for the summer. All right, a few more chores for your garden. Um, so one of the things that this is a perfect time of year or a perfect time of year to do is to divide and transplant. So while your plants are still dormant, you can divide or transplant your perennials or shrubs that have outgrown their space. So this is a really good time to dig those up and either half them or in some cases um, you might, you know, cut them into fours or sixes or even eights. Um, and if you have a garden that has overgrown somewhat, uh, you, you may even get 
more. I've seen gardens where we've come in and uh, they planted a butterfly garden and they have all of these wonderful plants, but they've, they've overgrown quite a bit. Um, so we, can, we might even be able to make 50 plants out of one plant, depending on the size. So this is a really good time to do that. Um, you can do that later in the fall or you can do that in very early spring. Um, they're going to be less stressed by the move right now. Whenever you try to move them um, in the summer or when they're not dormant, um, you put a lot of stress on the plants and you're more likely to lose the plant when you go to transplant it somewhere else. Um, that way they can, uh, you know, when they're not dormant, they can focus on um, sending all of their energy into creating new roots and really, um, you know, getting themselves established in the soil. So um, you kind of want to um, move your perennials in the opposite season to when they bloom. So for instance, if you have a fall blooming perennial, these, this would be the time that you would want to move those. Um, your spring blooming perennials are probably already greens. So this is not the ideal time to move those. You actually want to move those in the fall. fall. Okay. Um, next, you want to plant your cool weather annuals and then also your cool weather vegetables. We're actually getting to the point where we might even be a little bit late for our cool weather vegetables, uh, but you will find that at quite a few of our garden centers, there are transplants. It's not too late to put your transplants in, um, you know, your chard, your um, lettuces, your cabbages. You still have a few more weeks, especially if you have an established transplant, that you could put those in and still have a nice cool season uh, vegetable crop. Um, all of your cool season flowers like pansies, this is the time you want to be putting those in. Um, your peas, cabbage, radishes, beets, uh, those are all something that you can put in your plot right now. Um, all right. So um, don't be tempted to turn over or dig into wet soil. We talked about that earlier, but just to reiterate, um, it's going to become really hard when it dries out. Um, you know, the soil compaction we talked about. Whenever you start moving around wet soil, you create soil compaction, um, which makes it difficult for your plants to get good roots established. Um, the next thing you can do is purchase some floating row covers. We've talked about this a few times in talks we've done in the garden. And this picture right here, uh, hopefully you can see my arrow. Um, this is a, an example of putting row covers over. Um, one thing that we often have are little white moths that you see um, going around your cabbages, especially, uh, but most of your winter uh, or your uh, cool season crops, um, those are actually going to burrow into uh, into your crops and they're going to they're going to have a problem. The caterpillars of them are going to create problems. So if you put a row cover on when you first plant your plants, um, before anything has the time to um, to already burrow into the soil or into your plants, then you can actually prevent a lot of that. Um, and also, um, the thing about row covers is it allows the water through, it allows light through, it doesn't allow insects through. Um, so it's a nice organic way for you to um, protect your plants without putting, putting any sort of pesticides on them. Um, so this will be the time of year that you want to do that as you uh, plant in those cool season vegetables um, or cool season plant, or especially vegetables. But even if you have some tender plants uh, that you want to kind of protect for the freezing nights, um, you could put a, a, a nice thin row cover over them that would keep them protected overnight if we have um, a threat of frost. Um, next, you want to put out any sort of plant supports. Um, you know, if you are planting tomatoes at the end of May, or um, you've put any peas out, or anything that you want to climb up a trellis, um, your peonies, your cucumbers, um, or anything, any other plant that's going to need a little extra support to sit up straight, 
um, this is the time to put that out. It's best to put it out when you're first planting things rather than waiting until they start to get established and they're already starting to grow um, in an opposite direction or just a different direction to what you want them to go. So this is the right time for you to start putting those out there. As you put your tomatoes, put a small stake. Uh, remember, you know, we've had a lot of really windy days the past week. Um, so that would be a good example of why you would want to stake those. So if you um, you're actually a little early to have put tomatoes out, but if you put some of your peas out and things like that, you're not too early to put those out, but you might want to give them a little help um, to, to start to get them going in the right direction. Um, so many people have tried to force those peony stems into a peony ring uh, with kind of disastrous results, you know, because once they get going, it's hard to to then try to rein them in with a peony ring. So um, something to think about. So this is, uh, like I said, this is a short presentation, but we really wanted to get you started on the right track to have a wonderful garden this season. So go out into your garden, get started, and um, we're gonna start talk to you, talking to you about more specific plants soon. All right. Um, Thank you very much. If you have uh, any questions, I know there are some questions in the chat. Um, also, I have my contact information down there. So if you want to screenshot or take a quick picture, um, if you ever have any gardening questions, um, you can either use that belinda.chester at rutgers.edu. That is my direct email. Um, the Atlantic County Master Gardener at njaes.ruckers.edu. Um, that is our Master Gardener email. Both of them will get questions to our Master Gardener hotline. Um, or you can call our office. Um, as I said earlier, I'm actually not in the office right now. Um, however, you can um, give the office a call and they will get a message to me and I will give you a call back. Um, just keep in mind if when I call you back, um, I'll be calling from an unknown number um, just to, you know, and the same thing with our master gardeners. Sometimes they will, um, they'll call back. Um, they're going to be calling from an unknown number. So, um, you know, if you want to give us a time period that works best for you so that we know when is the best time to call, um, please leave that with the secretaries as well. Um, so I'm going to open it up. Um, some of the questions that are in chat right now um, are questions I'm going to have to get back to you on. Um, I know Lori had to leave, but um, keeping groundhogs, we actually do have a Rutgers fact sheet on that. And in fact, let me see if, um, I'm not sure if while this is up, if I can get that fact sheet um, address. But um, let me see if I can get it on here. Um, if you type into Google Rutgers fact sheet and groundhogs, that will actually give you, uh, there's a Rutgers fact sheet on how to um, deter groundhogs and other rodents. Um, and I will also send a copy of that fact sheet to um, Alexis and Amy so that they can put that up with the recording of this presentation. Um, where can you get a soil test? You can actually get a soil test. Um, you can either give our office a call at the number that you see there on the screen, um, and we can give you instructions on how to do the soil test. Um, and you can come into the office and either purchase the soil test kit, um, which is just a, a canvas bag and a plastic baggie to put in it and an envelope and instructions. Um, so you can purchase that. The soil test is $20. So you can purchase that at our office or you can go on, you can um, again, type into uh, Google Rutgers soil test lab and um, the soil test, you can actually send it directly to the soil test lab. Make sure you indicate that it's from Atlantic County. That way we get a copy of your soil test and we can go over it with you if you have any questions um, without you having to send us a copy. Um, so you can either go directly to the Rutgers soil test lab or you can give our office a call and we do have soil test kits available. Um, if you're doing a soil test, what you want to do is you want to go around, you want to look at, take a look at whether, um, for instance, if you're looking at lawn, you want to, do, you know, if it's the front lawn, that's one soil test. And then your back lawn is a completely different soil test. Um, your vegetable garden is a different soil test um, from your lawn. So you want to take um, about 10 to 15 plugs out of the area 
um, put them in a bucket, mix them together, um, and then um, take out about a cup and dry out all of the moisture out of it. Um, whenever you send it to the soil test lab, they're actually gonna put it on a screen and they're gonna let all the moisture uh, dry out of it before they do your soil test. Uh, so save yourself some postage and um, go ahead and dry it out before you send it. That way it's a little bit lighter and, um, and you, there won't be the drying time as well. Um, so then once you send it to them, this time of year, um, it generally takes about two to three weeks, but it's possible. Um, thank you, Alexis, for putting that up there. Um, it's possible that you can get it within two weeks. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer because this is time, the time of year where a lot of people are starting to get soil tests. Um, so just keep in mind that if it, uh, you know, there may be a little bit of a delay as you, um, as you send one in right now. Um, let me see if I, um, I know Lori on uh, Weed Be Gone. Um, I want to look up some specifics on that one. So I'm going to um, look up something and then I will forward some information to Amy and Alexis so that we can, uh, so that they can post it up with the video. Um, I don't want to answer something with a pesticide off the top of my head. I want to make sure that, um, that we have the most uh, current accurate information on that. Um, and I may reach out just to see exactly where she was wanting to put it. Um, that does make a difference. Um, keep in mind that a lot of your broad spectrum pesticides, um, when you put them on, they kill everything. Um, so you want to be very careful if you're putting some sort of uh, pesticide that's meant for your lawn. You want to make sure that you're protecting your flowers and your vegetables um, because, you know, that if it's a broad spectrum um, and it hits your vegetable garden or your flower garden, it may also kill those plants. Um, so always be careful to uh, make sure that when you're using a pesticide or a fungicide um, or anything else, um, even a fertilizer, be sure that you read the labels. The labels are very, very important um, because they're going to be very specific about what the proper plants are, what the proper insect or bacteria or fungus, um, you know, what, what the things that that particular product is um, proper to be used on. If you use it on something else, it's likely that either A, it won't work, or B, it might kill a plant that you didn't intend to kill, or it may kill a, um, you know, one of our beneficial insects. Um, that you didn't want to, to kill. So you want to be very careful about that. Um, pesticide safety and making sure that you very specifically follow the labeling is very important. Um, very important to, you know, like I said, to, to keep you from killing plants you don't want to kill. Um, and then also for our environment. Um, you also want to look at those labels to make sure that uh, when you're using something, you're using it at the right time. Because if you use it at a time that uh, if you use it out of the time period that it's intended to be used, um, you're just putting chemicals into the environment um, without actually fixing your problem. Um, so always make sure that you read that and, and make sure that you're at the right stage, at the right season, and um, that you're using it on the right plant um, and on the right insect or fungus or bacteria. Um, let me see. I think that I got all of the questions in there so far. Um, are there any other questions? And I'm going to kind of open this up. Um, it doesn't have to be something about spring gardening. If it's something that I can't answer off the top of my head, um, if you could, you know, we'll have you type that into chat and I will get back to you. Um, you'll get an email from either that Belinda Chester email or the Atlantic County Master Gardener email. Um, so any gardening questions at all that you have, we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to type them down in chat. Um, uh, were there any, I think there might be one in Q and A. Ah, they were the two questions we've already answered. Um, so the soil test uh, lab, there's a link down in chat if you, uh, if you need to get a soil test kit. And again, you can also call our office, 609-625-0056, um, and just tell them that you're looking to get a soil test kit, and they'll give you um, instructions on how to pick it up and everything. Um, so let's see. We'll kind of give everybody a minute. I don't want to jump off too fast if anyone has questions. You're welcome. All 
Right. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions right now. But um, again, if you have, you know, if you get off of here and you think of some other questions, they don't have to be spring related. Um, we do have our helpline. The contact information you uh, see there is for our Master Gardener helpline. Um, so anytime you have any kind of gardening question, um, even if it's, um, you know, I'm starting a new butterfly garden and I'm looking for some recommendations on plants, um, you can give us a call for those types of things. If you think you have a fungus or a weed or something that you want identified or something that you want some help in finding out how to get rid of it, uh, we're always happy to answer those questions. Um, you know, and uh, right now we're working mostly by email, but um, we still have the ability to take your samples. If you want to bring in a sample for something, you bring it into the office and then um, and we can also, you know, take a look at it, put it under the microscope and see if we can figure out what your, what your issue is with your plant. Um, or we may have asked you for some photos through email. Um, that's another way that we can try to help you out without you having to go into a public building, which can be uncomfortable for some people people right now. Um, so we're always here to help. Um, we have a Facebook page as well. So um, you can always send a message to our Facebook page, or you can send a message to our website, which I will put down in chat right now if you ever have a question. Um, there is a contact form on our website um, that you can, um, you can put your question in as well and we will get back to you. Um, thank you very much for coming. I know this was very short, but it was a quick, uh, let's get you started. And remember in two weeks, we have our, um, we have our tomato project that is coming up. Um, our, we have our tomato uh, presentation that's coming up. That's actually going to be uh, Rick Van Vranken, who is our um, county agent for vegetables, is going to be doing that presentation. And hopefully the weather will co cooperate with us and we can do that outside in the garden. Uh, but if not, we will always jump on Zoom and still have the presentation um, or try to reschedule it at a time where we can um, actually go out into the garden. Um, all right. So thank you very much for coming. And again, just send me an email if, um, if you have any other questions. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Thank you so much, Belinda. That was really fun. <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> Oh, good. I learned uh, what a P 